you, Allen County, for letting us serve as your public library in 2022. We love being your place for community resources, enriching programs, diverse collections of books, and more. Thank you for your unwavering support over the years. It's the foundation around which we build our staff and library services. Your ACPL has been serving the residents of Allen County for more than 127 years, and every day it continues to be a true honor. As we look to the future of your ACPL, we're excited to continue fostering lifelong learning and discovery with a laser focus on the growth and needs of the entire Allen County community. Thank you for joining us in this effort. We are your ACPL. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> I am Susan Beyer. I am the executive director of the Allen County Public Library, and I want to welcome you to the Allen County Public Library and also wish all of you a happy National Library Week. Can we get a round of applause for that? <laughs> I'm curious, show of hands, how many travel from out of state to be here? Oh my goodness, give yourselves a hand, I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're showing you some Hoosier hospitality tonight. <laughs> well, this is National Library Week, and this year's theme is There's More to the Story. Libraries are full of stories in a variety of formats, from picture books to large print, audiobooks to ebooks, and much more. But there's so much more to the story. Library infrastructure advances communities by providing internet and technology access literacy skills, and support for businesses, job seekers, and entrepreneurs. Library programming, like we have tonight, brings communities together for entertainment, education, and connection through book clubs, story times, movie nights, crafting classes, and lectures like tonight. Sarah and Beth's appearance was made possible by the generous support of the Friends of the Allen County Public Library. Could our friends of the library please raise their hand if they're in the audience tonight? I'm a friend. <laughs> I see some hands back there. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you, friends, for making this possible tonight and for your support and advocacy. You can learn more about the Friends of the Library, including how to join, at their informational table in the Great Hall after tonight's program. Also in the Great Hall are representatives from the League of Women Voters of Fort Wayne, of which I'm a member, um, and they would be happy to share information about voter registration, early voting is going on right now, and the work of their fine organization. Tonight is a discussion about civility, nuance, and grace surrounding difficult conversations and how to move forward when faced with division. As you might be aware, there has been divisive talk about public libraries on the national and state level. What feels incredibly supportive, encouraging, and affirming for my colleagues and myself tonight, this National Library Week, is to see a theater full of people, our Allen County neighbors, plus new friends visiting from multiple states and across Indiana, here tonight because they believe in the transformative power of the public library and of Sarah and Beth's work. Thank you for showing up to your library and for your library and for your library staff, and thank you for showing up for Sarah and Beth. Let me tell you more about our special guest tonight. Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers host the popular podcast, Pantsuit Politics, which was named one of 2021's best shows by Apple Podcasts and has been featured in The New York Times, The Atlantic, Good Morning America, The Guardian, Elle Magazine, and Parents Magazine. They are also the authors of now what? How to move forward when we're divided about basically everything. And I think you're wrong, but I'm listening. A guide to graceful political conversation, which were both featured on MSNBC's Morning Joe. Sarah and Beth met in college before going their separate ways for law school. Sarah pursued a career in politics as a congressional staffer and campaign aide, and Beth practiced law before serving as a human resources executive. Sarah lives in a city where I was proud to call home for four years as their library director, Paducah, Kentucky, and she lives there with her spouse Nicholas and children Griffin, Amos, and Felix. Beth lives in Union, Kentucky with her spouse Chad and children Jane and Ellen. Sarah's dog Cookie and Beth's dog Lucy are beloved and involuntary contributors to their work. <laughs> Please give a warm welcome to our special guests tonight, Sarah Stewart Holland and Beth Silvers. Uh, 
Hi, everybody. It's so Hi. delightful to be here. I live here now. Um, and I don't mean Allen County, I mean the Allen County Public Library. Um, now, Susan did have an unfair advantage because she knows the, the key squares on the Sarah Stewart Holland Bingo card. Um, first of all, the cookies here are very good. That cookie cottage place is really delicious. I need a good cookie place. Um, there's a Lincoln Center here about Abraham Lincoln. Y'all know how I feel about him. And I know you're like, Sarah, why do you have this binder in your lap? Okay, did you guys know about the Allen County's Genealogy Center? I'm obsessed. They had to drag me out of there. I asked them about one ancestor, and they made this for me, guys. Now, I'm not allowed to read aloud to you, which is what I really want to do. I really just want to go page for page and be like, what about this? What about, I mean, what an incredible, incredible resource. And also, you know, I'm just a daughter of a librarian. I love a library. I think it is one of the most important, beloved, dare I say, sacred places inside our communities and in our democracy. And that is why we are so incredibly delighted to be here with you tonight. And I'm gonna put this down. But it's kind of hard. Oh, really? oh, we had the privilege of talking with former Ambassador Marie Ivanovich on our podcast recently. She served as the U.S. as ambassador to Ukraine. And something that I will forever remember from that conversation is her talking about how when you have lived through an era of real corruption and communism, civil society breaks down. And I think we take for granted that we are just sitting in the heart of civil society tonight, that we have a library, that we have the League of Women Voters. When you walk around in Fort Wayne, you can just feel like civil society is alive and thriving here, and that's what enables us to do democracy well, to have good government. So even when we feel really down about our political climate, which, you know, is fair from time to time, um, I'm going to always hold on to that, that civil society is here, and even when it feels like it's being attacked, it's here, and we're all here tonight to talk about good government, and that just gives me hope. It's impossible to do the work that we do and not feel really optimistic about America because we get to be in spaces like this with people like you. Yeah, I think our civil society in America is like that, the famous story with the, the old fish swims past the two young fish, and they, he says, how's the water? And they go, what's water? I mean, I think we, we swim in it. We take it for granted that we have these public spaces like libraries, that we have institutions um, that even when they're under attack, like public libraries, where we can still gather freely and have a conversation about disagreeing with one another, about what does that mean when we fundamentally see things differently? What does that mean in a pluralistic society? What does that mean in a democracy when the name of the game is persuasion? That's the name of the game, is we're trying to persuade each other. We're trying to work on each other. And I think the reason libraries are so special is because persuasion that we encounter in our everyday life often looks like marketing, right? We're so, we're so baked in that consumer mindset, and that's not, what you're at at a, that's not what you are at a library. You're not a consumer. You're a citizen. You're not buying anything. Um, and I think that that is so incredibly valuable and special. Every space where we can be a citizen and not a consumer is really important for the work we're going to talk about tonight, where we are engaging with each other in a long game, not a, I'm going to give you these statistics, I'm going to share this Atlantic long read, and we're going to, do, we're going to fix it. We're going to fix it right here, right now. I'm going to persuade you, and then we can move on in agreement together in utopia. Like that's just never how it goes. And the more spaces we can, we can build that muscle memory of like, no, no, I'm gonna leave this conversation frustrated. I'm gonna leave this conversation angry. I'm gonna leave this conversation with a list of 15 things I wish I'd said, but then I'm gonna have another one. Then I'm gonna come back again. I'm gonna engage again. I think that that is incredibly essential to our work as citizens. <laughs> Have any of y'all seen the movie Air about Michael Jordan? This movie was made for me. Okay, it has Matt Damon in it. I love Matt Damon. I could watch Matt Damon Matt just Damon. Ocean's Eleven all the time, just hanging out with his buddies, having fun. Um, but they're talking about making the Air Jordan shoe, and there's this really poignant scene where they're getting ready to meet with Michael Jordan's family to try to convince him to come to Nike. And they say they only want one shoe on the table 
because the second that you put several shoes on the table, it diminishes the value of the one shoe. That's what consumerism is about, right? Scarcity, making us feel like there's not enough and we wanna be the special one who gets the special thing. And libraries are about abundance. The biggest fights that we have about libraries is about what is not included, because we presume this is a space where there's always room for more on the shelf. And that's why I think it's such a perfect metaphor for thinking about being influential on one another in, in a democratic society, that there's always room for more space, and that the presence of one thing doesn't negate the presence of another. Uh, I loved what Susan said to us at lunch, that libraries have this very liberal return policy. If something's not for you, you just bring it back, it's fine. Uh, that's a really good way liberal to be about our opinions. Policy. It's especially a good way to be about our takes. I was thinking about this earlier, that, that I want to have that liberal return policy about my takes. Not my values or my principles, but that willingness to say, I tried this, not for me. I'm going to put it back and try something else. And I'm going to see this cumulative effect of having tried all of those things over time and letting each one work on me in its own way, even the ones that feel way off base, like not my genre, uh, still letting them in enough for me to think about them and they help refine me and where I am. So I don't know if y'all follow me on Instagram, but I spent the drive here listening to all seven hours of The Witch Trials of J.K. Rowling. It's a long podcast series, guys. It's really long. And what struck me the most is the opposite of what Beth just described. There's a real vibe with Joe that I, I did all the research. I really leaned in. I learned everything I could. And I'm done now. And this is where I'm at. And that ain't it, baby. That ain't it. Like, that's not how it works. And that's not definitely not how it works around hard, difficult conversations. If we show up saying, I'm done. I figured it out. And this is where I've settled. We're not going to allow people to work on us, which means we're not listening which means we're not gonna work on them. We all want that really great uh, chemistry where we get to work on somebody else, but they don't work on us. <laughs> no, I tried. It's not doable. Um, let me tell you where you learned that firsthand, parenting. You're like, no, listen, I've got a plan. I had a therapist one time where I was talking about how distressed I get when my child cries. And she was like, well, do you expect him not to cry ever or be upset? And I'm like, no but just under my pre-approved, developmentally appropriate scenarios. <laughs> and she's like, mm-hmm, tell me more about that. And that smug therapist way they always do, where they're like implying that you're being ridiculous because you are, but you're not ready to hear it yet. Um, and I just think that's what we do with each other. We're like, I have pre-approved the, the talking points of this conflict. I have decided where you are wrong and I am right. And we're going to march lockstep through these. It's going to be great. And at the end, you're going to go, you're right. And that's not how it works. It's not how it works in real life. It's not how it works on Twitter. It's not where it works anywhere. Um, and the sooner we can let that go and sort of lean into the flow, not because just like a, the flow of water, you're not going to get water up your nose or flipped upside down in the tide. Like, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Um, but that works on us, too. It's that, that decision to be worked on that allows us to work on other people. I also listened to many hours of this podcast today, but I cannot do two times the speed like Sarah does, so I'm behind her. It makes my blood pressure rise when I listen to it faster than normal speed. Now, people talk It's very slow. stressful for me. Mm -mm. But what really jumped out at me was the conversation that they were having about the history of book banning early in the show. And there was, um, I think it was Jerry Falwell that they grabbed some sound from saying, we as parents should be able to control the destiny of our children. And I thought, did you read that sentence before you said it out loud? <laughs> Nothing in my life experience has given me the idea that I'm gonna get to control the destiny of my children. They show me every day that like, Godspeed mom, we are doing our own thing. And that I think is part of what's really making us all feel so escalated about politics right now because we do want to have some control over where other people are. Um, I'm, I'm in this real attempt to get to know my state representative right now. And this is a person that I did not vote for. And as gracious, gracious as she has been with me in our email exchanges about gun violence, I will not vote for her again because uh, we are on very different pages. But I am trying to get to know her. 
Um, I've invited her to come see my church's ministries that we do in the community. Um, I'm going to events where she is. I'm, I'm writing to her whenever I have a thought that I want to share, and I'm trying to express it graciously. But I've realized uh, I'm not a consumer for this person. I'm not her customer. And I don't get to control how she votes. So the only thing I have here is the opportunity to influence her. And the only way I will get to influence her is if we're in some kind of relationship with each other. And that is not going to come from me, you know, sending a resist bot message to her. It's just not. There are moments when that kind of activism is, is helpful, important, and powerful. You think about uh, the vote to repeal the Affordable Care Act in the Senate. I think that's when that sort of blast activism really meant something. But every single issue can't go that way or it becomes white noise for these people. And that's fair because they're people and they're dealing with a large volume of, of information. And this takes me back to libraries and books because story is the most influential mechanism that we have. And so being able to tell a story about who I am and how I see our community and my vision for our community to this representative is, is the best exercise of my democratic power that I know how to use right now. Well, and I think you see that spectrum of interaction with people as readers. Like, you have readers who are consumers. They are reading the same book over and over and over. And I'm happy for them. I am happy for you. Go forth. They keep the publishing industry running. They keep the gears at a public library strumming, right? Like they're just, they're knocking out those books like every two to three days. But you can also hear from people when they read like that, when the book upsets them, when they felt like there was sort of an agreement. Like I read this book, this is what I get out of it. And you sort of broke the agreement. You hear that in some of the, the angry book banning conversations. Like, no, 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 this is not what I signed up for. Um, I didn't want to be challenged. I didn't want to be in conversation with this text. I just wanted to consume it, right? You can hear that. You, once you start to see the difference between engagement and connection versus consumption and like that customer mindset, you start to see it everywhere. You start to see it everywhere. And it's why people are so mad all the time because they approach things as a consumer and the customer's supposed to be always right. And so when I'm not always right, I get really mad. Over uh, spring break, we sent my children to wait in the very long uh, fast food line. I believe it was for um, Qdoba. Uh, it was very long. They were very upset, but that's why you have children, so you don't have to do tasks like that. Um, They're not like having to plow the fields. They can no, at least exactly. get to Qdoba. I'm like, you can wait yeah. in the line. It was Chipotle. Excuse me. I wouldn't wait in the line for Qdoba. I'm sorry. That's a hot take. <laughs> um, but I would for Chipotle. And so they were so mad about it. But like everybody else was mad too. And so, you know, they were out of everything. They were like out of chicken. Okay. Like... Don't tell Americans you're out of chicken if you're at a Chipotle. Okay, they're going to be mad. And I talked to, and Griffin was up there by himself. He's 13 years old. And this person was like yelling at the party. He was really funny. He was like, how do we tip these people? We need to tip these people. They have been through it with everybody so mad. And I was like, I want you to remember what that person looked like. Watching them get mad, watching them lash out at the person behind the desk. Like, put that in your memory. Remember what people look like when they act like that. So when you're tempted to act like that, that angry consumer, like you have like a vision in your mind, you, it looks awful, doesn't it? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, I know. That like angry customer. And it was so funny, I think after the um, pandemic where there was a lot of that, it was both extremes. Like I felt like when I was out in the world, the little I was, people were like bending over themselves not to be that person, not to end up on TikTok or the Instagram reels, acting, showing your butt, as we say in the South. Um, and so it's just like, I think that, that that dance we're always doing with each other, like I'm mad, I'm frustrated, I want somebody to hear me. I want somebody to hear how mad and frustrated I am. And the, oh, I don't wanna be that person who's acting ugly because I'm so frustrated. There's that whole spectrum of a dance we do. And when we lean too hard into that consumer mindset and just, I wanna be heard, I don't wanna be worked on, I don't wanna work on somebody else, I just want somebody to witness my rage. There's just nowhere to go. Like we've all been, you feel frozen when people act like that because there, there is an energy, but there is no momentum to that. 
There is no forward movement from a moment like that, right? Even the best customer service rep, you just hear them like repeating themselves over and over and over because there's just, there's nowhere to go. And if you want to go somewhere with your fellow citizens or your family member or your partner, there has to be some momentum. And I think the momentum, it, there can be conflict. There can be momentum after conflict, but not if it's just witness my rage, listen to how angry I, I am. That's all I care about. And the flip side of that rage coin is the silent treatment, which we also do. We don't want to encounter that rage, so let's just not discuss it at all. Or I'm going to cut you out of my life, or I'm not going to talk to you about this ever again. Before I left today, I was walking my 12-year-old through some friend drama. She has a friend who every couple of months will give her the silent treatment and will say she's mad at my daughter Jane but won't tell her why for a few days. Red flag. I thought, well, (laughs) this is exactly what I told her. That's correct. That's what I told her. Um, we, we We were discussing the issues, and I said, hey, I think you deal with the underlying problem however you want to. But the advice that I would like to share, if you are willing to hear it, I try to ask for permission. Sometimes I get in front of myself. Um, is that giving someone the silent treatment is a way of taking power over them. She has made your stomach hurt for two days. That's not how we treat our friends. That's not how we share power in our relationships. We shouldn't do it in our house. Your friends shouldn't do it to each other. You shouldn't do it in your classroom. Your teacher shouldn't do it. If somebody has an issue, we need to express ourselves about that issue and work through it, not hold power over somebody else by saying, "My, I am upset and you can sit here and wonder why, because I'm gonna let you care about me more than I care about you, that's not fair. We do that to each other politically all the time, all the time. And so our work, I hope, is about saying, let's just help you find some words to keep the momentum going. I think some people come to us wanting to know how to win the argument with their family members, and we disappoint them, and I'm sorry. I hate disappointing people. But the long game of what we're trying to do is say, just keep going. There's, there are more words, there are new questions, there's a new way, there's a new pattern that you can develop here. Keep going, because it is that momentum that's key to us finding any kind of consensus within our families, even if consensus is not the goal, for us to just keep connecting with each other, keep getting to know each other, keep getting to know ourselves, keep showing up to vote, keep annoying our state reps like I am right now, just keep doing it. Well, because I think what, you know, we are always learning. We are continuing to engage. We are continuing to connect. One of the most powerful lessons I learned from our audience was after our second book, Now What? We had all these conversations with listeners about these different levels of connection we talk about in the book. Because the first book, I think you're wrong, but I'm listening, um, was really very high level, right? Like what we learned about sort of polarization generally in the first couple years of doing the podcast. And we always joked that people would say, okay, I listened. And I still think they're wrong, so now what? Um, and so that, the second book was our attempt to say, okay, well, the context of that relationship matters. Are we talking about your dad? Are we talking about your fellow congregant? <coughs> Excuse me. Are we talking about somebody you just encountered on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial? Like, where, where, put, place me in time and space here, okay? And what I learned from one of the conversations with our listeners is, and In families in particular, I don't think this is a word we use, but I think it's relevant, but really it's relevant a lot. I think people react to power. They hear that word and they think, I feel powerless all the time. Do not tell me I have power. And there's a really strong reaction. I think a word that's, excuse me, I'm gonna take a drink of water so I don't cough on y'all again. I think an even more helpful word is status. Because there is a flow of status all the time, particularly in families. Somebody gets married, that's a change in status. Somebody has a kid, that's a change in status. Somebody gets divorced, somebody leaves the house, somebody moves back in, that's all a flow of status. And that's true in all of our connections. There's this this ever-present flow of status. And sometimes just naming that tension from those different statuses can open that momentum up can help move it forward. Say, I I feel like, mom, you think I'm rejecting you and that hurts your feelings. Like you're not important in my life anymore. You are important in my life, but I can't agree with you all the time. That doesn't reduce your status. 
in my life. You are still influential even if I disagree with you sometimes. Just naming that tension, naming that sort of flow of status in jobs, even, you know, in these big places. Like, I mean, I think you look at some of the states around the country. You look at Georgia. There's some changing status there. You can see it in their elections. And I think the more we can sort of articulate that and narrate that and name it, that, that also lends that momentum, that forward momentum to the conversation, to the connection, to the relationship. And it's easy for me to get a little bit impatient with my fellow citizens and think, why is it that we're all walking around in one of the wealthiest nations to ever exist in the history of Earth, feeling like we have no power or agency and everything's terrible all the time? But then I get, you know, a dose of reality. I've spent the past four days dealing with a health emergency with my mom, and I sat with her for two very long days in the hospital. And you get in a hospital, and I feel a real sense of powerlessness and a real loss of agency and a real loss of personness. And that's not because anybody's doing anything wrong. It's because it is a system built to deal with lots and lots of people in very acute situations. And so I feel when a nurse comes in that they should see my mom the way that I see her and see that her pillow has gotten kind of weird and we're afraid to touch it because we don't want to hurt her and that she needs some chapstick and that she would love to brush her teeth. And they see how's her blood pressure, how's her oxygen level. And, and that's we're all kind of doing our parts there, but it can feel really depressing to be in the midst of a place like a hospital. It can be really depressing to see how people are treated in their workplaces. The spaces that we spend the most time and that make the biggest mark on us are often not lovely places that are part of civil society like we get to be in tonight. They're places that send us the message like, you are just one of many and we got a lot going on here and none of it is about you and your care and your comfort. And so that helps me just build my compassion muscles back up that yes, if you compare 2023 America to almost any other place and time in history, we got a real good thing going that I would like to spend more time feeling grateful for. And even in the midst of that, a lot of us aren't getting our stories told the way that we hoped, um, our personal stories or stories that feel representative of us at all. Well, and look, a library is a great place to talk about this for lots of reasons. Any librarian will tell you it is not utopia. It is not a beautiful, peaceful, lovely space all the time. There is a lot of humanity flowing through a public mm -hmm. library. Lots and lots of humanity. They are encountering some of the most difficult issues of our time. And I don't mean book bans. I mean drug addiction. I mean homelessness. I mean some really, really tough, tough stuff. And that's why, right? Because the doors are open. Because any stories we tell ourselves that we can shut out that stuff is a lie. It is a lie. You can live in a gated community and that stuff is still affecting you. The library is just more open and honest about it. They can't shut the doors on it all. And I think that, that there's a real beauty in that. But there's a real vulnerability too. And that's what we're trying to guard against in these conversations in a lot of different places with public policy, um, with our politics, with our partisanship. We're trying to guard against vulnerability because there's a lot of vulnerability when you open up to your fellow humans. As my friend Lacey says, people are the worst and also the best. It's weird. I don't know. Um, and I just love that because I just think it's, it's true. We're the best and the worst. It's weird. You know, like you just not a lot you can do about it um, except for open up to it because closing off. Closing off is a decision that leads to disconnection, that leads to loneliness, that leads to anti-democratic tendencies, um, and all those things. And I think you see that, that beautiful, human, vulnerable, like, love. I don't really know another word for it in a library. So we love talking to each other, and we can do that for a long time. It is how we make our living now. But we would much rather talk with you tonight, since we're happy to be here in person. Um, so I can also read this aloud, guys. Just say the word. <laughs> so we're going to open it up for Q&A right now. I want you to know that we, we don't fear questions. Uh, we don't fear pushback. We're happy to talk about whatever you'd like to. We really love to be useful to you. That is our greatest hope when we're out and about like this, that you leave with something that is 
pretty immediately useful to you. So uh, we'll just open it up. I think you have some questions in advance for us. There will be library staff who will be circulating with cards and pens if we have some other questions. Beth is, oh, I see her right there. Beth, wave to the crowd. She's got the She's question for you guys. sheets for you. Perfect. But here's a great one to start off. As part of making a profit, social media needs to make us angry and divide us in order to keep our attention. What do we do? <laughs> I would like to unplug it. I'm ready to unplug it. I should put that motion <laughs> on the floor. No more. <laughs> that's your full possession. No, I mean, I, okay. <laughs> I was like, that's it? Just unplug it? Okay. I really am People getting closer and closer to People are not going to let you unplug TikTok. It ain't happening. You're going to pry TikTok from their cold, dead hands. <laughs> Look, I do think spending less time there is really important. Sarah mentioned this podcast that we both listened to about J.K. Rowling, and, and the, my big takeaway from the whole thing is everybody needs to get offline a little bit here. Like, all of this behavior has been incited so much by on online things. Um, I think it is important at this moment to make a decision about what you want social media to be for you. We've had it long enough now. We've tried out a bunch of different versions of it, right? We went through a period when we were like, Beth Silvers is exhausted. And I see that in my memories. I'm like, why? Why did I do that? That's strange. So we've tried the constant diary move. We've tried the let me show you my kids and vacations move. We've tried the let me share the Atlantic piece so that you all come to agree with me about this move. I think it's time to make a decision. What do I want this to be for me? And you know what my answer is? Shopping. I like to shop on social media. Amen. I don't want to do anything else. I just want to buy, like, I just got this uh, really excellent face cleanser. That's all I want from social media. And my life is better now that I've made that decision. And when I see people who primarily believe they know me through social media, it reinforces that decision. That happened to me this weekend while I was with my mom in the hospital. Here come some folks that I never see. And they're like, how was your trip to Disney? And I think, I don't, that's not how I want to know you. Um, so I'm going to stick a card in the mail to some of those folks who I saw because I do want to know them. I do want them in my life, but I want to know them in a, in a more three-dimensional way than my Instagram photos afford us, and I'm just gonna stay there and shop. <laughs> well, I mean, the way they make their money is the shopping. They need to advertise to us. It's an advertising platform. Um, so I do think there's a benefit to just being more open and honest about that. Like, you're, we're here to you're here to be advertised to, and we're here to advertise to you, and that's how we're gonna make our money. Um, and I think people, a lot of people are more comfortable with that. I don't know if my Instagram shopping makes my life better. Oh, jury's still out. Um, but I do think that it has to go beyond just like our individual choices. I think it's really important to think about what we want it to be in our lives, but I think it's also important to think about what we want it to be in our society. And I think we're asking those questions. I think particularly we're asking those questions about children and teenagers. Uh, Beth and I had this conversation. There's a lot of sort of class action suits and discussion. They've, appro they've approached my school district to say, would you like to join this suit? Because the social media companies created teen mental health crises and then the public school system uh, picked up the tab on dealing with said mental health crisis. And so let me tell you something. When the trial attorneys come sniffing around, there is not just smoke, there is fire. You know what I'm saying? Like they're not here because they don't have anything to stand on. They only get paid if they win. So I love a trial attorney. That's not an insult. Um, and so I just think like there's something there. I think we're getting close to, to, to having this conversation in a real way in like a, I like a legal process way to have this conversation with actual consequences. And so I also, you know, and I think we, we're learning this. I just have to remind myself they're not permanent. Facebook felt like it was going to be a major part of our lives forever. It felt untouchable in that way. And now it's like a joke, you know, like I'm not saying Facebook isn't still a behemoth and very powerful. It is. And it's very important in some small businesses, um, lives and some people's lives. And I use it a lot for my disabled son because I have support groups on there with thousands and thousands of parents who offer me information. I have no idea how I would have gotten before social media. And all the same, like my 13 year old is probably never gonna have a Facebook account. You know what I'm saying? He's not gonna have any social media at all until he graduates from high school, um, if I have my say. But he's definitely not gonna be like, ooh, put me on Facebook. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. that's not what he's, but there's no like teenager out there like begging to have a Facebook account, right? And that's like, it felt like it was just gonna be the, the universe we existed in. 
but it changes everything and it changes so quick and artificial intelligence is gonna change that. It's gonna change a lot of things. But I'm not gonna say everything because again, I'm not gonna fall in that trap again where we think it changes everything and we're all still here shopping and fighting and doing like the basic human things, you know what I'm saying? We just do it on Facebook now. But some of us, the old ones. Um, and so I just think like that's what I have to remind myself too. Is like I can kind of get in that space where I'm like, they're so powerful, they're changing everything. I'm like, no, wait, pump the brakes. Like that it felt like what that way. And now it feels that way about TikTok. TikTok won't last forever either. You know, like it's not gonna be this thing that's in our lives forever. They're just too amorphous to be permanent. They're too human to be permanent. Thank you. I like this one a lot. Best approach for hit and run political digs. Friend <laughs> makes derogatory comments, then immediately changes subject before you can respond. Oh, I thought you wanted to like do them yourself. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, do. I mean, I can help you, but that's really not what we do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm relieved by the posture switch there at the end, yeah. <laughs> so my family does this a lot. <clears throat> We have a group text. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. Some days it is, some days it's not. Um, and my aunt sent a bumper sticker that said, I'm gonna cuss off, that's okay in a public library. I could shit a president better than Joe Biden. They know me. Um, it, you know, it's like not a surprise, you know? Like I do this for a living. Um, so I responded, do you want to do this with me now? Because I just want to see Taylor Swift in concert and I'm feeling very empowered. <laughs> so I'll do this. And she's like, no, I just thought it was funny. And I was like, but you, like, and I, and I didn't, I didn't keep going because I was like, well, I didn't. And you knew I didn't and I still don't. And I got in with my dad a little bit separately than that where I was like, I don't get it. Like, I don't understand where this is coming from. Um, like, and then I sent some statistics, which I just told y'all not to do. I'm not perfect. Um, <laughs> But like, I, I do find humor helps a lot in those moments where I can just like, if you can get in quickly and just be like, what did you think was gonna happen? Like, just be honest. Like, you know, that, that was, it felt insulting and then you just moved on. What am I supposed to do? Like, I think that there's a space to just sort of, not even humor, but to point out the absurdity in 2023 to make digs like that and like, to what end? For why, you know? Yeah, I'm not super funny, but I do compassion. That's well. not true. She says so, all the truth. It's not true. I can go in a situation like that and say, whoa, uh, it seemed really important to you to put this in the thread. <laughs> Is everything okay? You, should we talk? Because it felt like you wanted to say something to me through this and then you just moved on and I'm cool. I will have this conversation with you. Uh, what is it that you want to express here? And, and, you know, that's disarming to people too. Like, I think if somebody throws a bomb, they expect to be met with a bomb. And so whether you're being funny or super kind or kind of like oblivious, like, I don't, I don't understand what you were doing here, all that is surprising to them. And when people are surprised, then they have some space to surprise you too. And that's really what we're looking for. Just, it's, it's so boring to do the memes exchanges, right? Like, I don't want somebody's bumper sticker in my text messages. If we're here to go deeper, then let's go deeper. I call that kindness shaming. That's what I call that. I love a, I love a kindness shame. Oh, I'm so sorry. I did not mean to offend you. Please tell me how you feel about this. And I do like the, the, there, that went away around, like, sort of post me too. When somebody says something, a sexist joke, you'll be like, no, I don't get it. Explain it to me. <laughs> Why is that funny? Yeah. And then they're like, uh. <laughs> A very important question for Beth. What brand of facial cleanser? <laughs> I knew that was coming. It's Oak Essentials. I feel like I've died and gone to heaven. So it's made by Jenny Kane, who has advertised on our show before with her very expensive furniture. It looks really nice. It is out of my budget at this moment in my life. I'll be truthful with you about it. It's like not her cleanser. Pillow. I can pay for her cleanser, and it feels it feels fantastic. Highly recommend. Okay. My child sniffed a thread on one of those pills the other day. About lost his life. <laughs> and then my son, my other son, was like, "Well, you probably got it for free." And I was like, "Not the point." <laughs> And she sent us one blanket, and it's my most prized blanket. And I will not let my dog near it or my children. They'll get near the blanket. I'm like, you're too close to the blanket. Get away. Back away. Stop packing. <laughs> Step away. 
Some friends are wondering if there are any new book plans. Oh. oh. No, go ahead. No. In a word, no. Um, look, I, maybe we will again someday, but right now, I think writing a book is fun, and I think selling a book is miserable. And I have no desire to do that again anytime soon. I like writing books. <laughs> so I would like to write a book again. Um, but no, no, not Im any immediate plans. I don't even have any like ideas in my head that yeah. I really want to like work through. So not right now. We're too busy hanging out with all y'all again. I would, I would rather do this a hundred times than think about, it's the selling. The writing is great. I really enjoy it, but the selling is terrible. So there was a Beth specific question and there is a Sarah specific question okay. I want to get to. Y'all want me to read aloud? Yes, I do. <laughs> Y'all, my, my great-grandfather murdered his last two wives. There's some juicy stuff in here. And shout out, I believe Elizabeth, the librarian who put that together, is in the house tonight. Elizabeth, there she is. Let me just tell y'all, Elizabeth thought she made this, and she's done with me. She has just begun. <laughs> we are going to be email buddies. <laughs> Sarah, any insight on your work as a CASA volunteer mm. that can help inspire audience members to consider becoming a CASA in Allen County or their local community from a current CASA volunteer? Oh, I love that. I love that. Um, yeah, it's incredible work. What I tell people if they're considering CASA is like, I just had some like abundant mom energy that I really did not need to push towards my kids. They get enough. Um, you know, you know, you meet those people and you're like, you've got a lot of abundant mom energy. Um, and I'm one of them. Uh, so no judgment. So I love this work. It is hard work. Um, but you know, I think that if you have a good understanding of sort of the, the child welfare system and that it's just, it's hard, just know it's hard. Um, and don't be intimidated by that. It can be incredibly rewarding. I mean, I have a very difficult case and have for the last two years. It's an eight sibling set and the mother is in jail. Um, so she's not coming back. Um, and they're spread out and, um, there's like interracial fostering situations. It's just, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough one. And you know what? It doesn't matter when I get with those kids. I'm not thinking about how hard it is. Like they are just, um, so fabulous and I love being with them and they are loving and they are funny and um, they think I'm great, which is like really nice. Um, so if you just want kids to like show up and love being around you and think you're great, it's a really fun job. Um, no, it's, I think that it's important work because the child welfare system can seem so overwhelming, but I think it's always important to, take, to remember like it takes so little to impact a child's life. It takes so little. You do not have to foster. You do not have to adopt. That's great. And if you want to do that, we need foster parents and we need adoptive homes. But um, like just being a consistent presence in a child's life, like I, it's, it's, you know, when you feel overwhelmed by the fostering system to know like, well, if you have Sarah Krasner on your bingo card, congratulations. Um, <laughs> to know that like I'm the, I'm the consistency. Like, yeah, it sucks. It sucks that this kid has been moved four times, but I'm there the whole time. He sees me at every house. I'm telling the judge, this is what I'm seeing from house to house. Like things aren't getting lost. Um, and I think that's really important and that's really powerful and it's really impactful work. And so, um, and it's not, you know, like I have three kids, one of them is disabled. I do this work and I still have plenty of time to CASA. So it's really great. It's a great volunteer work if you're looking for it. Great. One of our Indiana senators, Todd Young, has truly been doing bipartisan work on issues like child care. How can we encourage someone like that to turn to solving problems we care about, like gun violence? Well, that's a big ass from that's... Todd Young, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, and it's not because I mean like him personally, I just mean like in the position, in the Republican party, like, I mean, he can't turn that ship all by himself, you know? Um, no, Todd Young is doing good work. And I, you know, look, Mitch McConnell, <laughs> has a really high rate of voting for those bipartisan bills the last two years. Who to thunk? Um, and so I try to like, I really try to, to like when you say, how can you encourage? Like, I really try to say, it's like, you know, it's like you kind of like, 
What is it? What was I watching? Oh, it was Ted Lasso when she was telling her how to fire somebody and she was like, compliment, fire, compliment. Works with your congressional representatives too. And like, I see you do this bipartisan work. I'm really encouraged. Also, you were really crappy on gun control. Could you do something about that? Really great job on that infrastructure bill. You know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you gotta do, kind of wrap it up. And I do do that. I like, I, I, Really, really don't like my state senator, just like on a personal level. Um, not even policy, just don't like him as a person. Uh, but I send him a nice note when he does something I agree with, even if it's like not as far as I wish he'd gone. I really do think that stuff matters. Um, and so I think complimenting when you see the compliments and then never missing an opportunity to go like, I wish you would do more on this. Um, but I think particular with, gun, with like gun control and gun violence um, inside the Republican Party, that's just... It's a tough nut to crack. I don't know if Todd's up to doing it all by himself. Uh, I really appreciate a lot of what Todd Young has done and the way that he's done much of it, um, especially around chips and manufacturing. And I bet he doesn't get a whole lot of thanks for that. So I think if you decide, like, this is kind of my new mindset. Like, I'm, I'm making my state rep my project, right? I think it, we don't want to make people in our lives say, projects. We don't, people, not make people projects. Like, don't make your friends a project or your mom and dad or anything. But a state rep, I think, is a good person to make your project. And if you want to make Todd Young your project, I would do that. Like, where you set a Google alert and you see something come out about him and you say, I saw it. Like, I appreciate this. Or... Here's what's happened in my community. I knew you would want to know because I saw this thing where you cared about a community like mine. Like, they're people. They need some flattery. They need some uh, positive affirmation. Do, like, it's so ugly. We had uh, Representative Derek Kilmer on recently on the show. He is funny and delightful. And we had a very non controversial chat with him. And when I saw the replies to where he posted about our show on his social media, I just thought, why does anybody do this? This job is awful. The way people treat them is awful. So if you get in there as a positive and somewhat consistent presence, I do think you can make an impact. The other thing with gun violence, I think that we have two instincts about this. Either we need to be well-versed in the exact bill that we're writing to support, or we just want to say, do something, I don't care what it is. And I think finding a nice in-between is helpful when we're contacting our representatives. If there's a bill that you support, by all means, tell them I support this bill. But if you really just want to say, there's a lot that I don't know about this, I want to tell you about where I live and who I am and what keeps me awake at night. And I want to ask you to consider meeting with me or meeting with this group or listening to these advocates. Here are people who are speaking about this in a way that connects with me. You do not have to be an expert to do meaningful outreach here. And you also don't have to reach out to them in that sort of scream, demand, consumer type way. You, again, you want to surprise them with your communications. Did any of you all see that amazing op-ed in the New York Times about the grandmas uniting, the guardians of the aquifer? So you should look this up. I think the title of the piece was Grandmothers Unite. But it's about this group of mostly older women in Nebraska who work on climate change issues. They preemptively go to uh, representatives' offices with pies, like right out of the oven, like warm cheddar apple pie. Now, I don't want to eat that, but maybe they do. Apple pie, that's gross. <laughs> maybe they do in Nebraska. But they, they take these pies to say, hey, it's a legislative day. Thank you in advance for considering the environment when you vote today. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And they do it with a lot of joy and it builds a lot of community among them and they know it's a long haul. And that is a really unsatisfying approach to an issue like gun violence that really does keep us awake at night and that twists in your stomach when you think about putting a kid on the bus or if you're a teacher getting dressed for work and you're thinking about going into that environment. It's, that's, it is deeply unsatisfying to think I have to bake a pie to deal with this. I get it. But I also think that we are all just people and we have to interact with each other that way. Well, because, I mean, he's a senator. He probably does get a fair amount of flattery. Um, it's a cushy gig. That's why they don't want to give it up. Um, but I do think what's su like the surprise component that's so important is to surprise him about a certain type of voter who he assumes hates everything he does no matter what. And so if you can disrupt that narrative, I really do think that's powerful. The more we can disrupt that narrative that like, 
they're, we're over here and they're over there and never the two shall meet. Um, but even for senators, I think that that's really, really, really important. And that's what the, the pie does, right? It, like it humanizes mm -hmm. everybody involved because that's what pie does. <laughs> so speaking of food, um, one question we received, I can actually answer, it was, where did you have lunch today? And good. we had lunch at Birdie's in the Bradley Hotel and it was lovely it was and good. Sarah made the pro call to order the warm chocolate chip cookie. Did I start with ice cream? It was so good, guys. That we all shared. Two good cookies today. The cookie cottage and that cookie. <laughs> it's a banner day. It is. <laughs> so back to politics. <laughs> From cookies to politics. How do you have fruitful conversation with someone you don't agree with when you can't even agree on facts? How do you find any common ground? Is there any situation where it's just time to abandon the conversation? I mean, yeah, for sure. There are times when like the conversation is not fruitful and you got to say like, I'm too mad. I got to get out of here. Like this isn't going to go anywhere. You're mad. I'm mad. We need to take a break. It doesn't mean I don't think it was important that we talked. It doesn't mean I don't want to talk again, but I'm too hot right now and I'm gonna have to walk away. Um, so I definitely think there are moments where we just have to go time out. Like we're not listening to each other. I'm too upset. Let's take a break. I think as far as facts, I think that's a very loaded word um, because, you know, and we've seen this, we understand this. We, you know, we played out a million times in American society that we will have a fact and it's all in how you, not just interpret it, but how you use the fact in your storyline. Um, and that's not to say that I don't think there are fundamental realities. Of course, I believe that to be true. Although I am reading this book about quantum gravity and it's really making me question a lot of things. I'm in a book club with a guy who likes books like this and they're very disruptive to my way of viewing the world. Um, <laughs> that's why they're good for me though. Um, and so I just think that sometimes it's, it's worth it to step back and say, okay, well, if we can't did, if we can't agree on this fact, like what is the story you're trying to tell and what is the story I'm trying to tell? Almost like that reflective listening you learned in marriage counseling. I heard you say that you think America is on death's door and everything is a threat. And I think you heard me say, like, you know, if we can repeat back to each other, like let's try to rearticulate this fact we can't agree on so that we can try to get underneath what we're trying to do with it. Sometimes I think sort of playing that investigative role that sort of examination, um, being curious about how we got here and what we're, what we're trying to do with that fact is really helpful. We get this question every time we're out and about. Everywhere we go, we get it by email all the time and I totally understand it. And I really am coming to the draft conclusion that we are rarely arguing about facts. The facts stand out to us because it seems like, how can we not even be on the same page about this? But there's something underneath all of that. So sometimes I think it's worth saying, where did you hear that? Why do you read that? Or why do you listen to that show? What is it about that that connects with you? Uh, because it's, it's usually gonna take us to that deeper place. Like here, well, th these are my people. Oh, well, how come? How did, the, how did Ben Shapiro get to be your guy? Um, <laughs> I'm interested in that. I have, I have a long ongoing conversation with someone in my life over Voxer about how Ben Shapiro came to be his guy. I'm just, I'm curious about it. Um, and I learned something new almost every time he answers that question, which he has done many times over the years, because I still don't get it. <laughs> um, and so I think if we want to really make a difference in these discussions, if we want them to be worthwhile, if we want them to be about connecting and learning more about ourselves, we have to be willing, as frustrating as it is, to sometimes put that disparity and facts on the shelf in pursuit of our motivations in this conversation. And then you can come back around to them. Like, it's, it's helpful sometimes, I think. I said this to people during the um, Mueller investigation a lot, because I read that whole report and did not encounter a lot of people who'd done the same. Um, and most people that I talked to did not care that I had read the whole report, because that's not what we were talking about. What the document said was not what we were discussing. It's not what they were interested in. Um, and you just, you know, sometimes just have to accept that and say, okay, what are you interested in? Let me go there with you, because I really am here to get to know you better, to understand you better. Um, and to hope that something good can come of our relationship. 
I teach argumentation at a Christian college. How do God I help you? <laughs> God bless you. How do I help Gen Z specifically care about listening, understanding, and all the civil society principles you mentioned? Okay, you guys, listen. This is very important. I repeat this daily to myself as I'm a 13 year old. Legalistic thinking is developmentally appropriate. Legalistic thinking is developmentally appropriate. I think if there is a like sort of a generational challenge with Gen Z and it's not their fault, but there is a fundamental building up, then tearing down and then rebuilding that you go through as you age, right? You kind of like raise up as your, like what your parents raised you to be. You kind of take, you figure out, you tear it apart, you decide what you want to keep and you rebuild it. And I think we've like, and I don't even know who I mean by we, just like culturally have sold them this line that like they get to skip to the end because there's so much information available to them that they can just skip to the end. Um, and that's a lie. Uh, you can't skip to the end. But we do that too. We think we'll like intellectualize our way to like someone understanding us or like we do it with kids. Like I'm just going to explain to you calmly why you can't get another drinking glass out or I'm gonna murder you. <laughs> I'm gonna explain it really clearly why this makes me wanna come out of my skin and you won't do it anymore and it never works like that. Um, and so I think like we all do it, but I think they, there has been this, there is a real undercurrent I hear that like, I will figure this all out. I will like, you know, get all the answers, like whatever, and then move smoothly. And I felt that and I, Felt it because I was watching Oprah, and I'm not here to criticize Oprah because I don't do that um, <laughs> ever. But I heard this message that was intended for my mom of like find your passion, and it was it felt like enormous pressure. Like, well, I better figure it out quick. Uh, I got to do. I got to live my passion. Oprah wants me to live my passion. Um, and so I, I think that t with with that generation, and like I try to work through this as a parent with my kids. Like, you don't have to figure this out. You have to fail. That's your job. Like, the job is to fail. The job is to figure out what you don't like, not go right out of the gates, live in your bed, or as my, as my 13 year old told me, he said, no, oh, nobody likes their job. And I said, I love my job. And he goes, yeah, but you lived your inner spark. And I was like, I do, you're right. <laughs> but like, that's not what happened in college. I couldn't major in podcasting in 1999. Um, and so I just think with that, like the, and you see that expressed in that civic conversation. It's just like the stakes are so high. Like we will go to college campuses and they will say like, well, what if I vote and I get it wrong? And I'm like, baby, they're going to give you another chance. Like, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Um, and you hear that with like, well, my vote doesn't matter. No, your vote's not determinative. That's different. That's that consumer mindset, right? That's not the same thing. Um, and so I just think like, it's all, it, it feels counterintuitive to get them invested by lowering the stakes, but I really feel like that's what kind of needs to happen hmm. because the stakes are too high. The stakes are too high. Um, and I, that's not because I don't think there are important things on the line. When you're a young person talking about gun violence, the stakes are pretty high. Um, but there's that sense of like, I have to get it right. I have to get it right. Um, it's just too much. We have to allow that, that give and take, that failure, that dance we do with each other, which is going to be inevitable stumbles, inevitable, you know, stepping on each other's feet. That has to be a part of it. And it's hard. You cannot explain and intellectualize a love of that. They have to experience it. Um, and because I think of a lot of reasons that, that the place they can do that is shrinking. Uh, the places they can experience that are shrink. So I, for seriously, God bless you, because I think that's important. I want my kids to take speech and debate. I want my kids to have those places. And he does like him and us, because I get the bark alerts when they cuss in their group texts um, about like what they're arguing about. And I think that's just so important, but it is going to be legalistic. There's just, there's no shortcut around that. I think Gen Z really needs the rest of us to get ourselves together. <laughs> um, you know, when I think about the feedback that we hear from college professors about what they're seeing in the student bodies, we, we spoke at a conference of college deans, what we heard from them. There's so much fragility. And then when I listen to my 12-year-old, I understand why. She was coming home in second grade talking to me about how her, her teachers are overworked and they don't get paid enough. 
And that's true, and I'm delighted that she is a person that has that level of empathy in her, and she doesn't need to have that at seven. That's too much. Um, She's acutely aware of gun violence. She's acutely aware of climate change. Her whole existence has been hearing people my age and older say, hope you guys can fix it. Hope you can save it. These young people are really going to get it for all of us. And I've realized what she needs to hear from me is that my life is good. I love being in my 40s. I love being your mother. I love being married. I love being a member of this community. I love my job. She needs to see that like there, there, is, there is goodness ahead of her, even as there are a lot of problems and challenges. There always have been. There always will be. Your poor little brain is assimilating the list of those faster than anyone in human history has because the internet and the time at which you were born, that doesn't mean you have a greater responsibility for all of it than all of us who came before you had. And I don't know how we can kind of collectively deliver that message, except for maybe just whining a little bit less. And I don't mean to sound like um, high and mighty. This is a message I say to myself every day. Where am I communicating to her that everything is a disaster and she needs to fix it? And where am I communicating that that life can be good even in the midst of a lot of hard things and that we each have a role to play but not to hold the whole picture at all times in our hands as though it's all up to us. Well, let me get on the soapbox just for a second here. Um, I can't imagine why young people are so stressed when we try to win every single political argument by saying you don't care if kids die. All of them. I'm done. I'm done with that. I don't want to hear it anymore from either side. I don't want to hear that any more. Unless you are dealing with an actual serial killing child murderer, I do not want to hear you don't care if kids die. I just think it is, first of all, a terrible argument that moves no one. Uh, Second of all, not true. Almost everyone wants better for their kids. They might define it differently than you do, but they want a better life for their children. And if your child was hit by a bus, they would bend over backwards to save their lives. They wouldn't stop and go, how do your parents vote? That's not who we are. That's not how almost anyone is. And I think the way we have accelerated everything, abortion, gun violence, trans rights, gay rights, to you don't care if kids die, is out of control. And they are listening to us. They are listening to us. They are hearing us say, this is such a big deal. You should kill yourself over it. That's what we think is going to happen. You're going to kill yourself. We have got to stop that. We have got to stop that language. I think it is so damaging. It doesn't tell them. I think the most beautiful thing that has come out of political rhetoric in the last like 15 years is Dan Savage's It Gets Better. And I think every kid needs to hear that. It gets better. I think some adults need to hear that. It gets better. But like that, that sense of like everything is 11 and they don't care if you die. Your fellow citizens, these other adults with enormous power, don't care if you die. Even if you believe that to be true, is so harmful to hear on repeat every day. It's so harmful. And I wish we would find another way to engage with each other besides accelerating it to, you don't care if kids die. It's just, it's exhausting. And I can't ima- I just think it has to be so damaging to grow up hearing that message about every major political topic over and over from both, both sides. Sorry, that was a real soapbox situation there. <laughs> oh, applause, yes. Thank you. We have time for one final question. I think this is an appropriate one to wrap up on. Looking back at your eight plus years of podcasting, how do you think things have changed and how do you want to be viewed in history? No, I love that question. How do I want to be viewed? That's why I like writing books. I love that they go in the Library of Congress. That's the best part, that little page. And you're like, that's it. That's amazing. Um, how do, how do we think things have changed? That's the first part of the question. I mean, podcasting has changed dramatically. There's so many more celebrities podcasting uh, every day, a new celebrity and a new podcast. Um, I think like the industry has made it more difficult for anybody for us to make it as an independent podcast. Like it's just, it's just become more professionalized, um, which is good in a way, um, but much less independent, which I think is a bummer. Um, but the political space, I think, I see a lot of progress. I think the conversations have um, 
matured and I mean, mostly because we've just like exhausted ourselves. Um, but I feel like especially post COVID, um, there is a, a real integration happening of like what we've learned and what we want to do differently. And I think it's, I just, what I have to remind myself is that it's just a really slow process. But I think if you look closely, you can see the change happening. Yeah, I mean, we could talk all night about how podcasting has changed, but fundamentally, um, I feel a ton of freedom in our work because we don't think of ourselves as too attached to the podcasting industry. Um, podcasting is is the most important thing that we do. We say it's the solar, it's the sun in our solar system, right? Our our show is the sun in our solar system, um, but what's really our guiding light and our animating force having conversations with each other that help us learn something. And I don't really think about how I'm gonna be viewed in history, one, because that is very overwhelming to consider. Um, and I think I would get in my head a lot if I spent time dwelling on it. But more than that, what I've learned over our time doing this is that you have no idea when you are just constantly talking in public what is going to connect with someone and how it's going to connect with them and what it's going to mean in their lives. There are things that people come up to me when we're signing books and they'll say, you said this one time in 2016. And I have said it to myself at work so many times and it's made such a difference. And sometimes it'll have nothing to do with podcast, with politics. You know, it'll be just an offhanded comment I made when we were talking about facial cleanser or shoes or whatever. Um, so, what I most love about what we do is that I don't get to decide. I don't get to be in control of our legacy, just like poor Jerry doesn't get to be in control of his kid's destiny. I, <laughs> I just try to do this and keep having these conversations with Sarah with, with as much integrity um, and fearlessness as we can and learn what I can learn in the process and especially not be afraid of saying, ooh, I don't see it that way anymore. I know I did like 40 minutes on that in 2018 from this perspective, but I've changed my mind and here's why. And to know that I'll do that again in the future, I guess that's what I hope, that we're just continuing to be real people on a real journey and inviting people to go along with us. But you know, if I set up a guardrail for me, it's don't become an entertainer. Uh, don't do this for show. Don't, if, if this stops being interesting between the two of us, then it's time to move on and do something else with our lives. Well, I have this journal where you answer the same question every day for five years so you can like see your answers. And the best thing is I started in 2019, so like one year before everything changed. Um, and I think one of the things is like, how do you want to be remembered? And what I always tell people is what I want on my tombstone is she asked hard questions. I think 21 year old Sarah would have said she had the right answers. And I do often have the right <laughs> answers. I just want to be clear about that. Um, but you know, I just want to be the person asking the hard questions. I don't, it's very much, um, integral to how I see myself that I don't turn away from hard things. And I think that's what drew me to Beth. And that's what animates our conversation. I'm very that. difficult. Yeah. We love, it. <laughs> we love hard things. We yeah. love hard questions. We love hard issues. Like we're not, um, because there are, there are people that are not like that. There are people that want it to be easy and they don't want to look at difficult things. God love those people. I'm not mad at them. Sometimes I wish I was more like them, um, but I'm not. Like I really want to, I want to dig and scratch and say, but why do we do it this way? And if it's not working, why do we continue to do it this way? Um, and that can be really frustrating, but I just think it's, it's worth it. It's why we're here to say like, what's the, what's the difficult part of this? Can we lean in and what can we um, learn about ourselves and learn about each other in the process? And I get the sense that many of you are listeners, so thank you for letting us do this and make it our life's work. Thank you for coming out here tonight. Thank you for hosting us, Susan. Everyone here has been so gracious. Thank you to these incredible interpreters. I know, it's it's been such a joy uh, to share the stage with you. Thank you so much. There is going to be an opportunity afterwards for you to meet Sarah and Beth, say a quick hello, get a selfie. It, how many brought a book to be signed? We've got some that. books to sign. I believe they've also signed some book plates in advance that you can take home. Again, let's give them a huge round of applause for an amazing night of conversation.
production facilities provided by Access Fort Wayne. Learn more under the Explore tab at acpl.info.